are a number of gas laws, and we're going to talk about a group of them called the simple gas laws. So there are four basic properties of a gas. It's pressure, indicated with a capital P. It's volume, capital V. It's temperature, capital T. And the amount of gas, and this will be measured in moles, and that's given the symbol lowercase n. So these four properties are interrelated. If you change one, one or more of the others is going to change also. So the simple gas laws look at relationships between pairs of properties, just two properties holding the other two constant. And these were developed a long, long time ago um, by some people whose names are down here, right? Boyle, Charles, Avogadro. So Boyle looked at the relationship between the volume and the pressure of a gas. This is back in the 1600s. So he used a J-shaped tube, and he had some mercury in there. And then there was gas here, and he put a stopper in it. So he could measure the volume of this gas because it was a cylinder. He knew the diameter of the tube, and he could measure how tall it was, so he could calculate the volume of the gas just using geometry. And then he could calculate the difference in pressure by looking at the relative heights of mercury. So here, is the gas pressure higher or lower than atmospheric pressure? It's higher because it's pushing down on the mercury and causing the other side to go up. So you can think of this as being like, you know, two people having a pushing contest, right? They're both pushing on this thing, and who's winning? That's the stronger one. Well, this one's winning because this is lower than the other side. So he could measure the volume and the pressure of a gas. He kept this at the same temperature. He kept the same number of moles of gas in there. And then he would change the pressure of the gas. And he could do this by adding some mercury to the open end. As he's adding mercury here, that's going to push the mercury up on this side and cause the gas volume to get smaller. The pressure in here is still larger than the external pressure, and now we see that the difference between those is greater than it was before. So he's increased the pressure on the gas, and he can measure its volume. So he found that if you increase the pressure, you make the volume smaller. And the reverse is true. If you decrease the pressure, the volume gets larger. This is called an inverse relationship. One goes up and the other goes down. data from a Boyle's Law experiment might look something like this, where we're measuring the volume at different pressures of the gas. And we find that at, um, at low pressures, the gas has a high volume. And as you increase the pressure, the volume decreases. Increase pressure, decrease volume. But that's not a straight line, is it? So Boyle's law states that the, vo the volume is inversely proportion or proportional to one over the pressure of the gas. The, ga the pressure is inversely proportional to its volume. So we just looked at a graph of volume versus pressure, and that was curved. If instead we graph volume versus the inverse of the pressure, then we find that we get a straight line. So the pressure times the volume would e equal a constant, and so then we can derive this version of Boyle's Law. The pressure of the gas times its volume under one set of conditions would be equal to the pressure times its volume in a second set of conditions, or P1V1 equals P2V2. Here's what that data looks like. So this is what we saw before. 
volume versus pressure. Here, volume versus one over the pressure. Now we get a beautiful straight line. So what's happening when the pressure and the volume change? So we can look at this cylinder here. Um, there's a one kilogram weight sitting on the top and we have, let's see, two, four, six, there's 10 gas molecules in here. This is occupying a volume of one liter and the pressure here is one atmosphere. If we double the weight, this, this lid can move up and down, but it's airtight, kind of like a, a syringe. If we push down more on the top, that's going to increase the pressure of the gas. And by pushing that lid down, it's going to decrease the volume. So we see that the, vol the pressure increased by a factor of two and the volume decreased by a factor of two. Here we have the molecules. Um, they're colliding with the surfaces now more frequently because there's less room for them to run around. So they're gonna collide more frequently and that results in greater pressure. Questions? Um, Boyle's Law is important in scuba diving. For every 10 meters you go under the water, your body experiences approximately one additional atmosphere of pressure because of the weight of the surrounding water. Pressure doesn't change that much up above the water because you're just dealing with air and air is not as dense. But when you go under the water, the pressure increases significantly. So here we have a diver right at the surface. The pressure they experience is one atmosphere. If we go down 20 meters, we've gone down 10 meters twice. So we've added two atmospheres of pressure. The pressure down here would be three atmospheres. Yeah. Are you always at one ATM? At the surface of, at like, you know, at sea level, yeah, you're at one ATM. Um, it actually changes a little on the weather, right? Because there are variations in pressure. Um, so, but, but those are pretty small. Um, if you live at a higher elevation, then the pressure will be lower. And you know, like if you live in Denver, which is a mile above sea level, the pressure is significantly lower. And you go too high and then you can't breathe anymore. That's why people don't live up there. So if you went down to 20 feet and you were breathing, you know, the scuba tank, the air tank, and you take a breath and you hold your breath and rise quickly to the surface, you get to the surface and now the external pressure on your body and your lungs is only one atmosphere and the pressure in your lungs is three atmospheres. That's gonna cause the gas to expand and your lungs don't expand that much, right? So that would be really, really bad. So this is one thing they emphasize in diving, always exhale, exhale when rising. You need to breathe in and out as you go up so that you can get the pressure adjusted. Any questions? Any of you guys have gone scuba diving? <laughs> well, you, you had to, well, that's snorkeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so scuba diving is where you've got compressed air tanks. Yeah, I haven't done it either. I'm not actually very interested in that because it's kind of like going into a cave or something, right? You just, it's not natural. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what's down there and what if you can't get back out? It's just, yeah, no thank you. I don't even like to watch those videos, so. So this is all theory, but it has application. <coughs> 
Okay, so this, this is a critical thinking problem here. This is a challenging one. So a snorkeler takes a syringe filled with 16 milliliters of air from the surface where the pressure is one atmosphere to an unknown depth. The volume of the air in the syringe at this depth is 7.5 milliliters. What is the pressure at this depth? If the pressure increases by one atmosphere for ever, every additional 10 meters of depth, how deep is the snorkeler? Okay, there's a lot of stuff in there, right? So we read through the problem. Now we're gonna go highlight all the numbers. So we've got 16 milliliters. We have one atmosphere, 7.5 milliliters, one atmosphere, 10 meters. Those are gonna be important. This is a problem where it's helpful to draw an ugly picture. Yeah, don't we all just love ugly pictures? I, I, I always say ugly because then nobody expects very much, right? So, so here's the surface of the water. It's blue, right? Water's blue. And so we've got a syringe. It must be um, closed on one end. It doesn't have, you know, it's not open with a needle. There's the plunger. And what does this problem tell us about the volume of air in the syringe? 16 milliliters. The 16 milliliters. 16. Yeah, 16 is a one and a six. <laughs> just, just, you know, seeing if you're awake. Barely. Barely, yeah. 16, there we go. Why is it 16? We don't know, it just is. Okay, I'm not gonna draw the snorkeler. So the syringe goes from up here, near the surface, at the surface of the water. What's the pressure up there? One atmosphere. So pressure here is equal to one atmosphere. And they're gonna take the syringe down to a lower depth. And what happens to the volume? It decreases, it gets smaller. So now the volume is 7.5 milliliters. So why is that getting smaller? It's the pressure. So the pressure is essentially pushing on this plunger. It's pushing it in and causing it to be smaller. So we know the volume down there. And here's our question. Well, the first question anyway. What is the pressure at this depth? So the question is, what's the pressure down here? So this is gonna use Boyle's Law and the traditional way of writing it is P1V1 equals P2V2. So this is going to be a pair. You could call it one or two, it doesn't matter, but you need to have these two together because those happened at the same time. And these two belong together. I think most people would think of this as being P1 and V1 because that's where it started. That's what happened first. And this would be V2 and P2. Okay. So we've got this equation and we know three of the numbers and we have one unknown, so we can just solve this. So P1, V1 equals P2, V2. And what we're trying to find is pressure two. We need to rearrange this equation. There's a lot of rearranging of equations in gas laws. So I'm trying to get P2 by itself. That means I need to divide by V2. I'm gonna divide by V2 on this side. These guys cancel out. Bless you. So P2 is equal to P1, V1 divided by V2. Now, do we ever mess up and get the numbers mixed up the ones and the twos. Yeah, it happens. 
It's, it's really easy. So um, be sure you look at it, right? And so here I did the rearranging. I showed how it was happening. You don't need to do that unless you need to do that. Um, but I want you to show your work. So what do I mean by show your work? I want you to write the rearranged equation with the letters in it, the variables. Write it out like this, and then show it to me with the numbers plugged in with their units. So this is going to equal pressure one. Well, pressure one is one atmosphere. So that's one atmosphere. Again, units are super important. The volume up there was 16 milliliters. So pressure one times volume one, 16 milliliters. And then I'm dividing by volume two, which was 7.5 milliliters. What happens to the units? The milliliters cancel out. And so then we're gonna do the math, right? One times 16 divided by 7.5, 2.5 one three three repeating and that would be atmospheres if we were going to be picky about sig figs um, the pressure of one atmosphere at sea level would be considered an exact measurement and so we're dealing with the two sig figs and so we'd say well the pressure down there is 2.1 atmospheres That makes sense? Yeah. Okay, so just, I was just confused why you had uh, four figures up there, but two. Okay. I didn't understand that, but you did, so that's all that really matters. Oh, yeah, my brain is working. It's okay, it's okay, and it's, it's fine to think out loud. So that's one of the questions. That's the easier question. The next one says, if the pressure increases by one atmosphere for every additional 10 meters of depth. Now we can kind of think about this in our picture, although, you know, I've written in the middle of the picture. But from here, if we go down 10 meters, the pressure is gonna be the original one plus one. And if I go down another 10 meters, it's going to be one plus two or two. Um, it's not exactly two, but it's going to be close to that. But how can we do it more precisely? Well, this is a conversion factor. This is a relationship increases one atmosphere for every 10 meters. That's the increase. Well, how much did the pressure increase in this example? 1.13, right? The pressure difference, um, P2 minus P1, is uh, 2.133 minus 1, which would give us 1.133 atmospheres. I can use this to convert atmospheres into meters. And I don't really have any here. I'm going to get rid of these guys. There. So 1.133 atmospheres times 10 meters for every one atmosphere of change. So they must be at 11 meters deep. Any questions? Yeah. So on an exam, would you like have a foil block and then a formula, or would you like give us a question like that and you can know which wall to use? Um, if I remember correctly, I do give you 
the gas laws on the information sheet. So we don't have to match the name to the formula? You never have to match the name to the formula. Okay. Right? Why do I even use their name? Well, it's a way to tell the, the equations apart, but also, you know, there's chemical history here, and these guys did some pretty amazing things. And so, you know, he's getting credit for this. So this is back to like 1600. 1600s. 1600s. Yeah, this was before electricity, before they knew what atoms were. Like well, and before they knew that mercury was toxic also. <laughs> A lot of these scientists um, had prematurely short lives. Oh, no, I had mercury thermometers in the 2000s. They're fine until you break them. So just don't break them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, knowing that um, Boyle's law is P1V1 equals P2V2, I consider that history of chemistry. And this class is not about the history of chemistry. We will learn some history, but I'm not gonna test you on it. And honestly, I have a hard time remembering which one's Boyle's law and which one's Charles' law. I remember Avogadro's, but not the other two. I get them mixed up, so I don't expect you to know that. 2.1 atmospheres, 11 liters. Okay, Charles Law. So, the scientist, J.A.C. Charles, he lived in the uh, 17 and 1800s, and he was looking at the relationship between the volume of the gas and its temperature. And so, what he found is that the volume of the gas is directly proportional to its absolute temperature. So Charles law, volume is proportional to the temperature, which means that the volume divided by the temperature is equal to a constant. And so then we get this expression of Charles law, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. But very important because this is the absolute temperature when we're dealing with gases, the temperature must be in kelvins. You can't use Celsius. For one thing, what if you had um, a temperature of zero, zero Celsius, which is the freezing point of water, right? That's a very common temperature. If your temperature was zero, what would happen in this equation? It'd be undefined because you can't divide by zero, right? And if we had below zero temperatures, then one of the temperatures might be negative, and then we'd have a negative volume. That doesn't work either. So the reason that the Kelvin temperature scale is important is that it never goes negative. And the value, the relationship between um, Kelvin and Celsius was actually determined using Charles' law data. So here, there's a sample of a gas. Um, an amount of gas is one mole. And here we have a pressure of one atmosphere. And so the volume of that gas as a function of temperature in kelvins gives us a straight line. Now the data points only go down here to zero Celsius but we can extrapolate the data. We can draw a straight line as far as we want. Take another sample of gas. Its volume is going to be smaller because there's less gas in it, but its volume will change with temperature. And again, we can extrapolate the line. Here's a smaller sample. Again, extrapolate the line. All of these lines intersect at one point. Where the volume is zero, so the, the y-intercept, I'm sorry, it would be the x-intercept. When the volume is zero, then the temperature would be negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. And so that gives us the relationship between Kelvin and Celsius. It's called the absolute, it's called absolute zero. Temperatures below that are theoretically impossible. Negative volume, also impossible.
So what's going on with the molecules in Charles' Law? And this is something you could do at home. Take a balloon and put it in some ice water and it's going to kind of shrink down and get smaller, right? Colder temperature, smaller volume. What's happening to the gas? Well, as the gas gets colder, its kinetic energy becomes lower. It's not moving as fast. And so now these gas particles are moving in slow motion. They're not colliding with the walls as frequently, and so the pressure is less, right? And they take up less space. Then you could take that same balloon and put it in some boiling water, heat it up, and the balloon will expand. You've increased the kinetic energy, and the particles are moving around. They're taking up more space. Any questions? When the temperature increases, the gas particles move faster. We get more collisions with the walls, and the force then is exerted, that is exerted is greater. The only way for the pressure to stay the same then is for the volume to increase. There's a picture of a balloon in, I think, liquid nitrogen. You get all shriveled. This is a hot air balloon. I remember being fascinated by these as a kid. I mean, balloons are just kind of cool, right? And in cartoons, you can blow up a balloon just using your breath and tie a string on it and it floats, right? But like, cartoons are all about breaking the laws of physics. That doesn't happen in real life. You blow up a balloon just putting your air in it and what happens? It goes to the floor, right? because the air inside is very similar to the air outside, plus you've got the mass of the balloon. If you have a helium balloon, the balloon will float, but if you put a hole in the balloon, all the helium comes out and the balloon deflates and falls. So those are all things that you learn as a kid playing with balloons. So here is a balloon with just air in it, and it's got a massive hole in the bottom but it will float up and carry people into the air. What is up with that? Well, you've got this big burner, right? So you're heating up the air. As you heat up the air, it expands and it'll fill up the balloon. And once it's got the balloon full, then the excess air will start to come out the bottom. Now you have less air inside the balloon than outside the balloon. It's less dense, and less dense things float, and so the balloon begins to float up into the air. So you can control the up and down with the burner, um, the side to side, you're at the mercy of the winds. Any questions? It's probably why hot air ballooning never you know, caught on as a reliable everyday means of transportation, because it's not very reliable, it's just kind of fun. Okay, here's a Charles Law problem. A gas in a cylinder with a movable piston, and this is a scenario for lots of these problems, has an initial volume of 88.2 milliliters. If we heat the gas from 35 Celsius to 155 Celsius, what is its final volume in milliliters? Okay, this is a more standard gas law problem. You still want to read the whole thing and highlight the numbers. And then highlight what are we trying to find? We're trying to find the final volume. So one approach that I like to use when dealing with gas laws, um, because it gets a little tedious if you have to draw an ugly picture for every problem, right? Some of them you don't need a picture for, but you need a way to organize those numbers. So we can make a table to organize the numbers. So the first number I come to is 88.2 milliliters. So I'm gonna write that in here, 88.2 with its unit milliliters. So that's gonna be a column. And in what letter represents volume? Capital B, right? 
write it with a pen, not an eraser. And since this is the first line of our table, I'm gonna call that row one, and I'm gonna call the second row two. So here we had an initial volume of 88.2, and then we're talking about heating it from 35 to 155. So which of these temperatures goes with 88.2? The first one, right? The 35 because that's the starting volume and the starting temperature. And then the temperature is changed, so the second temperature is going to be 155. And I'll call that column T. Can we use Celsius? No, we need to convert, convert to Kelvin. And you know, when do you use 273 and when do you use 273.15? It's never wrong to use the more precise value. In the book, they often don't. Um, here, these temperatures are just to the nearest degree, and so using 273 is not too crazy. So this gives us 308, oops, 308 Kelvin, and then 155 plus 273 is 428 Kelvin. So I needed a little more space in that column, but that's okay, I can make more space. So this box is V1. This box is T1, this box is T2, and so what is this empty box? V2. I'm trying to write with the eraser, it just doesn't work. V2. Well, what's Charles' law? Charles' law is V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. This one has fractions in it. And um, my experience is that a lot of students are not good at dealing with fractions. You end up with some crazy things. So I would advise you to get rid of the fractions as soon as possible. And we're gonna do that by cross multiplying. So the top of one side times the bottom of the other side is equal to the bottom of the first time side times the top of the other side. So B1 times T2 is gonna equal T1 times V2. And it doesn't matter if you put the T first or the V first, what matters is that you've got your ones and twos straight. We're solving for V2, that's V2 right here. Better not use green to highlight that. So I want to rearrange the equation. I got rid of the fractions now so I can really see what's going on. So to get V2 by itself, I'm gonna divide by T1 on both sides. So then I want you to write out V2 is equal to V1 T2 over T1. This is not the only way to solve these problems, but it seems to work the best for most students. Any questions about how I got the equation? So we wrote out the rearranged equation, and then we're gonna put the numbers in. And be careful, right? Volume one, 88.2 milliliters. And then I want temperature two, which is 428 Kelvin. I don't know what happened to that. And then I'm dividing by T1, which is 308 Kelvin. We want to show the equation with the variables. We want to show the equation with the numbers plugged in. 
So if you get the answer wrong, you can go back and double check. Well, is this really V1? Is this T2 or did I mix them up? And you can see that you got them straight. What happens to the units? The Kelvins are gonna cancel out. So we're gonna find that 88.2 times 428 divided by 308. Just messed that one. 88.2 times 428 divided by 308. 122.56. And the unit is milliliters. How many sig figs should that have? Three. So we're going to say 123 milliliters. It's the new volume. Gases behave like balloons because balloons are full of gases, okay? So you think about a balloon. If I heat up the balloon, does it get bigger or smaller? It gets bigger, right? So here the temperature went from a lower temperature to a higher temperature. We expect that the volume will increase. This volume is higher than the starting, so that is a good sign. If it was smaller, then we did something wrong. Any questions? One twenty-three. So this is one of those problems that's annoying to a lot of students because they're really um, you, you don't calculus you calculate this. You have to think about. It. Right. So the pressure exerted on a sample of a fixed amount of gas is doubled at constant temperature. And then the temperature of the gas in kelvins is doubled at constant pressure. What's the final volume of the gas? And they don't tell us what the initial volume is. So what, how can we do this? Well, we can say, well, it started out at a volume of V. If I take um, the pressure and I double it, what effect does that have on the volume? It decreases it by a factor of two, right? So that's gonna be divided by two. And now the temperature gets doubled. What does that do to it? Doubles the temperature. So now it's times two. And so the volume ends up being the same. questions? Last of the simple gas laws, Avogadro's law. This relates amount of gas in moles to the volume. And Avogadro's number is the number of things in a mole, and that's why I can remember that this one's Avogadro's number. So he was lived back in the 17 and 1800s. <coughs> and the, the concept of mole and the number comes out of his work. I don't believe that he ever established his own number, but it's because of his work that we know the 6.022 times 10 to the 24th. So he observed that the volume was proportional to the number of gas molecules or volume is proportional to N. So then we can say V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. What's a little different here is that we're counting the amount of gas, we're counting the number of particles or the number of moles of particles. We're not looking at the mass of the gas, we're looking at how many pieces are there. If you have equal volumes of gases, they will have equal numbers of molecules. What the molecules are, what the gases, doesn't matter. Gases are the only state that acts like this. So here's Avogadro's law data. 
measuring the volume as you increase the amount in moles. So as you increase it, it gets bigger and bigger. If you have zero, then the volume is zero. Question. Which action causes the volume of a gas sample to increase? And we have several choices here. One thing you can do is to just answer that question without looking at the choices. So we want the volume of the gas sample to increase. What could we do to make that happen? We could lower the pressure. So lower pressure would cause the volume to increase. What else? Increase the temperature. What about N, the amount of gas? If we put more gas in, the volume's bigger, right? So increase N. So here, this is, whoops. We were talking about decreasing the pressure, decreasing the temperature, decreasing the number of moles of gas. We'll worry about that in a minute. Well, this is all talking about decreasing. The one we're decreasing the thing makes it bigger is the pressure. Decreasing the pressure, keeping a constant temperature and number of moles. So that's the one that will cause the volume to increase. Here's an Avogadro's law problem. A chemical reaction occurring in a cylinder equipped with a movable piston produces 0.621 moles of a gaseous product. If the cylinder contained 0.120 moles of gas before the reaction and had an initial volume of 2.18 liters, what was its volume after the reaction? Assume constant pressure and temperatures and that the initial amount of gas completely reacts. Okay, this is not quite as crazy as the syringe in the water one, but there's still an awful lot of words here. Again, highlight the numbers with their units. And then the question, volume after the reaction. I'm gonna make a table to organize these numbers. I'm gonna have two rows, one and two. And I'll just go back through the problem and take the numbers as they come. So here, 0.621 moles, so I'm going to write that down. And what letter represent mol represents moles of gas? N. And here we have another one, so 0 0.120 moles, that needs to go in the same column. 0.20. So this was the gas before the reaction. The initial volume is 2.18 liters. Where do I put the 2.18 liters? In row two, with that 0.12 amount, because that was the starting point. So this is gonna be 2.18 liters. Now I'm guessing for some of you, you don't like the fact that the first thing is number two and the second thing is number one. We can fix that. We'll call that two and we'll call that one. There, now everybody's happy. So this is our volume, right? I made this one too long. So when you do this, you should end up with boxes with numbers in them and one empty box. And so this is V1. That's what we're, oh, no it isn't, V2. V2. V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. 
This is just like Charles' law where they give it to you as a fraction. So let's get rid of the fraction. We'll cross multiply. V1 and 2 equals N1 V2. And I am looking for V2. So I'm going to divide by N1, get rid of it on this side, and N1 goes on that side. V2 will be equal to V1 N2 over N1. And then we take our numbers and put them in. 0 0.120 moles. And oops. It doesn't matter, but um, let's be consistent. The volume first, 2.18 liters. And um, N2 is 0 0.621 moles. And N1 is 0 0.120 moles. When you're filling in this equation, it can be really easy to forget what those numbers represented and where they came from. Um, and that's why I recommend identifying them, actually writing it down. Now, if you don't want to do a table, write down N1 equals this and V2 equals that, so that when you go to fill in the equation, you don't have to go through and figure it out again. So here the moles cancel out. I don't want to do that. Moles cancel out. So 2.18 times 0.621 divided by 0.12. And again, all the numbers had three significant figures, so we're going to call this 11.3 liters. Is that reasonable? The amount of gas increased, right? So do we expect the volume to increase or decrease? It should increase. 11.3 liters. Here's another one. This one might need a picture. A scale model of a blimp rises when it's filled with helium to a volume of 55 cubic decimeters. When 1.1 moles of helium is added to the blimp, the volume is 26.2 cubic decimeters. How many more grams of helium must be added to make it rise? Assume constant T and P. This is going to be a red blimp. So here's our blimp, right? And it's floating. And at some point, it was kind of deflated on the floor, right? Let's, let's highlight those numbers. So here we have the floating blimp, and this is the not floating blimp. The question or the problem tells us that it will float, it will rise when the volume is 55 cubic decimeters. So this one must have the volume of 55 cubic decimeters. Now cubic decimeters is not a unit that we use very often, but it's a unit of volume and we'll just leave it alone for right now. So, you know, initially this balloon, this blimp was like totally flat, right? And so here we're, we're, we're told, it's so hard to do. Here we're told that 1.1 um, moles of helium was added to the blimp. So that's down here. N equals 1.10 moles of gas put into the blimp. And it kind of puffs up a little bit. What's its volume? Because when we add that much gas, the volume is 
we need to put more helium in to get it to fill up so it'll float, right? Well, it kind of seems reasonable to call this one and this two. Now, it's, it's asking us to find how many more grams of helium need to be added. But we've got N1, V1, and V2. What could we easily calculate? We could calculate N2. N2 is the amount of moles of gas in it at the end. So if we know this, then we could figure out the moles that had to be added and convert that to mass. V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. V1, N2 equals N1, V2. I'm trying to find N2. Divide by V1. N2 equals N1, V2 over V1. So N1 was 1.10 moles. I didn't make a table here because I drew a picture. Volume two is 55 decimeters cubed. Sorry, blank. And volume one is 26.2 cubic decimeters. What happens to the weird units? They cancel out. And we didn't need to worry about that. So 1.1 times 55 divided by 26.2 In the simple gas laws, what's important about the units is temperature has to be in Kelvin. The others, pressure, volume, and um, amount, well amount has to be in moles, but pressure and volume could be any unit as long as they agree. Any questions?